Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whenever you're watching this, welcome back to the Mr. Sin Channel. Today, geographers, is an exciting day. Not only are we going to talk about Rousseau's stages of economic growth, but we are also going to review Wallerstein's world system theory, the dependency theory, and so much more. Now, when looking at the world today, we can see that the global economy has become a key driving force behind economic growth for countries around the world. However, we can see that the global economy disproportionately benefits some countries over others. To start, let's explore Rousseau's stages of economic growth, which outline five stages of development that countries generally go through as they develop economically. Starting off, we have the traditional society. During this stage, the economy is mainly subsistence, with the majority of the population being engaged in jobs that are part of the primary sector, such as subsistence farmers. Generally, countries in this stage experience slow economic growth, have little specialization, and often lack modern technology. Speaking of the primary sector, if you need a review on any of the different economic sectors, make sure you go back and watch my Unit 7 Topic 2 video, which will review everything that you need to know. Now, the second stage of the model is preconditions for takeoff. During this stage, the economy begins to grow due to more investment in infrastructure and education. As time goes on, productivity starts to increase as new industries start to emerge. These new industries allow for more jobs to open up in the second secondary sector of the economy. As more jobs start to be centered around manufacturing and the processing of raw resources, all of which ends up impacting both the political environment and the economic structure of the state, as more foreign states become interested in the state and their resources. From there, society moves into the third stage, which is the takeoff stage. During this stage is when rapid economic growth occurs. During this stage, jobs start to transition out of traditional agricultural-based activities and into industrial industrialized activity. This new economic growth also leads to increased urbanization as more jobs and opportunities continue to open up for citizens in the secondary sector. States here also gain access to new technology, which helps increase their overall production. But unfortunately, we can also see states in this stage get exploited by foreign states as they seek to take advantage of their raw resources and cheap labor. Next is the drive to maturity stage, which is when a state starts to specialize more and participates more in global trade, all of which helps diversify the economy and create new opportunities for citizens in the tertiary sector. During this stage, we start to see a shift from heavy industrial industries to more consumer goods. As economic growth continues to occur and the economy stabilizes, states in this stage will often still see influence from outside states in their economy. However, the state is starting to become more independent and is now less reliant on the exportation of their natural resources. Lastly, there is the high mass consumption stage. Here, the economy becomes fully developed, with society now producing products that not only meet society's basic needs, but their wants as well. During this stage, the majority of jobs have shifted into the tertiary sector of the economy, with the state now being fairly independent from outside influences. States in this stage also often develop a consumer culture, as the economy becomes centered around consumption instead of manufacturing. By understanding Rousseau's model, we can gain insight into how countries' economies develop and change over time. However, it is important to note that this model has been criticized for not accounting for outside political and social factors. For example, the impact that colonialism had on states and their development. It also doesn't take into account environmental limitations on a country, such as a caring capacity and limited resources. Now, while Rousseau's model of economic growth states that all countries progress through a series of stages, our next theory rejects this claim, stating that countries often cannot follow the same path of development. I am talking about the dependency theory, which states that the development of certain countries are hindered by their dependence on developed countries for economic growth and resources. We can see this when looking at the global market today. Oftentimes, core countries and multinational corporations use their economic power to exploit the semi-periphery and periphery countries. This is often done by creating unequal trade relationships and investment. Less economically developed countries often rely on exporting raw materials and low skill labor to more economically developed countries, which ultimately does not significantly increase their own economic growth and development. Instead, it helps more economically developed countries get cheaper goods and services for their citizens. Sometimes this trade can actually negatively impact the developing country, as now their production is going to foreign states instead of going to their own citizens. Now you might be thinking, well, why wouldn't semi-periphery and periphery countries stand up to the core countries and negotiate better terms for trade? Well, to be fair, sometimes they 
do, but the problem is that if a less economically developed country demands better terms for trade, the core country or multinational company can just take their business to a different developing country. So we can see that the balance of power in the trade deal is tipped in favor of the more economically developed country. We can see this imbalance of power in global trade when looking at Wallerstein's world system theory. The theory breaks countries down into three main categories. Core countries, which are the most economically developed. Semi-periphery countries, which consist of countries with emerging economies that are not quite at the same level of core countries, but also further along than periphery countries. And lastly, periphery countries, which are the least economically developed countries and often have the lowest standard of living. The model is based on the belief that all countries are now interdependent on one another. Starting with core countries, we can see that they are purchasers of consumption goods from semi-periphery and periphery countries. Core countries are the ones that hold the dominant power and control the global economy. They are also the ones to most often exploit the resources of semi-periphery and periphery countries. Moving over to semi-periphery countries, we can see states that are in transition between the core and periphery. Semi-periphery countries are more industrialized than periphery countries and have more jobs located in the secondary sector of the economy. These countries also have established infrastructure for the exportation of goods, cheaper labor, and less regulations on the production of different goods and services, all of which leads to more production and exportation of goods from semi-periphery countries to core countries. Lastly, we can see periphery countries at the bottom of this global trade. These countries will often see their economy become dependent on just a few core countries, which often leads to the exploitation of the country's cheap labor and raw resources. Oftentimes, it's difficult for these countries to advance economically since so many of the country's resources are being exported to core countries instead of benefiting the local economy, which we can see connects back to the dependency theory, which we talked about earlier in this video. We've actually talked about some of these global imbalances and themes already back in Unit 4 when we looked at neocolonialism, and again in Unit 5 when we looked at the global food supply and talked about food insecurity around the world. So when looking at Wallerstein's world system theory, we can gain insight into the hierarchy of power and resources between more economically developed countries and less economically developed countries. All of which stems back to the colonial era. In fact, this theory acknowledges the role that colonialism and imperialism played in shaping the current global economic system. Colonizing countries created vast empires that led to the mass exploitation of resources and labor around the developing world. And even when decolonization occurred, many of these former colonies remained dependent on their former colonizing country due to the poor systems that were created while they were being ruled. Now, there are people who have criticized Wallerstein's theory and have pointed out that the theory fails to account for non-governmental organizations that offer microfinancing for individuals in developing countries. And it also fails to consider other programs such as microloans that seek to support individuals in the semi-periphery and periphery countries, allowing them to become independent and more self-reliant. One other concept that I want to highlight when looking at development is the concept of a commodity dependence. This is when a country has more than 60% of its total exports made up of commodities, which consists of raw materials or agricultural products. Countries with a commodity dependence are vulnerable to any price changes that happen in the price of the commodities that they export. These countries also see less economic development in other industries, since their economy is centered around just a few commodities. When looking at the world, we can see many countries that are located in the periphery or semi-periphery have a commodity dependence. The problem of having a commodity dependence is that the state becomes extremely vulnerable to any external changes in the commodity that they depend on. Oftentimes, commodities see significant changes in their price over time, which can end up crippling a country's economy. States that have a commodity dependence often become overly reliant on the commodity's revenue and end up neglecting other parts of their country and economy, all of which limits their diversification and limits development in other sectors of the economy, putting further reliance on the commodity that is being exported. Today, we can look at Venezuela as an example of a state with a commodity dependence. Currently, around 65% of Venezuela's exports consists of crude petroleum and refined petroleum, which is a significant amount. However, if we go back to 2013, we can see that these two categories consisted of just over 95% of the country's exports, causing their economy to become extremely reliant on the exportation of oil, which ended up having disastrous consequences in 2014 when the global price of oil fell, resulting in a collapse of the Venezuelan economy. So we can see that the
the world today is more connected than ever before. And this global trade has real life impacts on countries around the world. But now comes the time to practice what you've learned. Answer the questions on the screen and when you're done, check your answers down in the comment section down below. Also, while you're down there checking your answers, make sure to hit that subscribe button and check out my ultimate review packet for more help with your AP Human Geography class. It is a great resource that'll help you get an A in your class and a five on the national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time online.